Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today at the Miami and Israel Innovating Agrotech and Food Tech Talk. Uh, sorry I'm not there today, uh, but I hope this presentation will work. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Venture Cafe Miami for putting on this great event. So I'm just going to go ahead and jump right into it. Um, my name is Lior Barchai. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Envonix. Envonix is an agriculture technology startup based down here in Miami, helping indoor farms uh, you know, achieve optimal efficiency and growth through the application of new technologies. Uh, I am born to two Israeli parents. Uh, father is from Kibbutz Saad, uh, which is a agriculture kibbutz down in the south of Israel. Uh, and my mother is from Haifa, which is in the north of Israel. Uh, I was born and raised down here in Miami uh, until I went to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to get my bachelor's of science in mechanical engineering from Carnegie Mellon University. After graduating from Carnegie Mellon University, uh, I co-founded Envonix with Kumar Nikhil Raj Agrawal. Uh, Kumar is actually here in attendance. Uh, feel free to uh, catch him and introduce yourself and ask him any questions that you may have. Uh, he's probably wearing the same shirt as me. Um, Kumar is from India and his family also has roots in agriculture. Um, and then lastly, I'm also a proud member of the South Florida Israel Thai Council. Um, so why we brought you here today is to talk about ag tech and understand a little bit more of why it's important and, and why we need to pay attention to it. Uh, so what is ag tech, agri tech, agro tech, uh, has many different names, uh, but really it's the use of technology in agriculture, horticulture and aquaculture. Um, right, the idea is to use this tech to improve yield, efficiency, and profitability, uh, and this can be presented in many different ways, mainly as products, services, or applications. Um, so why should we care about ag tech, and why is it important? Right, number one, it's because how, it's how we get our food, uh, and if we start looking at our population, as we approach 2050, our population will get close to 10 billion people. That's a lot of people on this planet. Uh, and we're going to need to grow 75% more food uh, with access to only 5% more land, right? So that's a, that's a lot of food uh, with not that much space to do it. Uh, Norman Borlaug quote is quoted, in the next 40 years, farmers will have to grow as much food as they have in the last 10,000 years combined, right? That's a lot of food and that's a lot of mouths to feed. So what are some approaches we could take in order to achieve that uh, amount of food and feed our population? So some ways, uh, there's two types of agriculture, right? There's, there's outdoor agriculture, which is the traditional agriculture we know of, of growing on land in big fields. Uh, and then there's controlled environment agriculture, which is growing in greenhouses uh, and really being able to control the three basic elements that you know, require to grow a plant, which are water, air, and light. So some of the ag tech applied, let's first look at, at outdoor agriculture. Uh, so for outdoor ag, we're seeing autonomous tractors being developed, right? To, to increase efficiency and decrease the labor required to farm these large fields. Uh, we're also seeing applications of drone technology, being able to take aerial views of the fields and really understand what's growing well, what's not growing well, and where can we apply, uh, you know, some more fertilizer, et cetera, things like that. Um, and then in controlled environment agriculture, uh, we're using a lot more data-driven approach. I think they're both using a lot of data-driven approaches, but in controlled environment agriculture, um, you know, we're seeing the use of autonomous robots uh, inside greenhouses to decrease labor, uh, to increase efficiency, and really just roll out food as much as we can and as fast as we can. Uh, we are talking about Israel here uh, and the collaboration with Miami and agriculture tech. So just wanted to highlight a few technologies from Israel. Um, Israel is the leader in global agriculture technology, and that's because of the land that Israel is located on, which is half desert, half mountains, uh, a lot of different landscapes. So we had to figure out how to grow efficiently. Uh, so no, the number one tech Israel, I think, is known for is drip irrigation, where we're dripping water on top of the roots directly uh, and really precise uh, you know, irrigation. Some other tech is soil sensing, uh, really understanding the, the moisture in the soil, the nutrients in the soil uh, in certain areas of the fields, and then also water recycling. How can we reuse all the water we're using, uh, especially in a land where you know, water is a limited resource, right? These are just some of the technologies uh, highlighted in Israel. Um, and you know, there's many more technologies being developed every single day in Israel, especially around agriculture. 
So I like to focus a little bit more on indoor farming and controlled environment agriculture, because that is where Invonics tech uh, really, you know, is applied and focused on. So the methods of growing indoors is hydroponics, aquaponics, or aeroponics. Uh, and one thing to note about these methods, uh, they do not use soil, right? It's a soilless method. So all the nutrients the plants are getting are directly from uh, the water itself. Um, the, some of the benefits of these methods is using 90 to 95% less water than traditional agriculture. So in lands like Israel uh, and in deserts, right? Where water is a, uh, you know, a scarce resource, right? This is a great way to continue to grow. Um, we can also grow all year round, right? And independent of weather conditions, right? Because now we're indoors and we're controlling the water, air and the light. Right? So being able to grow when it's minus 30 outside or it's a cloudy day and still achieve a good grow and a good yield. Um, right? With controlled environment agriculture, we have precise resource utilization, allowing us to you know, grow fresher produce and uh, decrease the cycle times in order to grow faster. And most importantly, it's to get close to the consumers, to grow close to the consumer where food is freshly harvested and delivered to your door uh, within you know, 24 hours. So Envonic's vision for the future of agriculture is really a decentralized indoor farming that's close to every single major city. So basically right outside Miami, we'll have a couple of different farms that are able to support the local economy and the local population with the produce that we need. Uh, this is, you know, locally grown produce at, it, at its core. Um, and then it allows to get it allows us to get you know more access more access to nutritional produce um, you know today if you go into the supermarket and you go buy a head of lettuce it's most likely from california or arizona um, and that means half its life it's spent on a truck uh, right so minimum nutritional value because it was harvested earlier to make the, the trip and a low shelf life because you know we don't have uh because it's it spent most of its life on a truck so how is Invonix delivering on this vision? Uh, we've developed an, our system called EVE, which is Invonix Vertical Environment. Uh, it's basically a suite of IoT-enabled equipment powered by AI decision-making brain to help farmers grow efficiently and optimally. We did this by targeting water, air, and light, being able to monitor those parameters uh, as detailed as, as possible, and then also controlling those depending on what the plant is requiring in that moment. So some of the benefits of our system. So far, we've been proven, we've, we've proved to increase yield by 50% with our nutrient management system, right? This was done by having precision control over the crop's nutrients and really giving the crops the nutrients it asked for and it's consuming. Those have air quality monitoring, which we compare with the nutrient monitoring to understand is, is air influencing the nutrients, right? Temperature, humidity, and CO2. Uh, and then this allows us to increase resource utilization for the farms, right? Put labor in more profitable jobs uh, and decrease the amount of input and still get a greater output. Lastly, all these things, you know, they get passed down to the consumer through reduced pricing, which, uh, you know, ends up being more accessible, uh, getting nutritional produce being more accessible to, far to consumers like you and I. Um, that is all I have today. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for coming to the event. Uh, if you want to find out more information about us, check us out at invonics.com. You can find us uh, also on all social media platforms. Here's my contact info. Uh, and then, you know, Kumar is, is in the stands as well. So go ahead, say, say what's up to him. And um, thank you and have a great evening. Hello everyone, my name is Maria Laura Vaca Flores and I am the Square Eat CMO. Today we're going to talk about our company. Square Eat is a new food concept created to revolutionize the ready-to-eat meal plan industry. Thanks to our unique production process, we can transform raw food into a standardized pre-cooked 50 gram squares that are healthy, tasty, with all preserved nutrients, long lasting without any additives, and easy to store and deliver. Let me introduce you my team. Our team is a combination of young entrepreneurs, highly rated chefs, nutritionists, designers, and web developers with more than 50 years of combined experiences. The idea behind Square Eat comes from a very common issue. People often struggle dealing with a busy lifestyle, trying to keep up with a healthy and proper diet without sacrificing food taste. Our CEO, along with our research and development team, 
spent countless hours in the kitchen perfecting our squares under every aspect to solve these issues. But why is with it? How did we achieve this? When recipes were brought to life, the texture was something we work on the most. Our efforts have paid off as our squares reach an even better texture compared to the regular food. In addition, we have to take into consideration the taste, balanced ingredients, and nutritional values. We focus on developing techniques that allow us to standardize food while keeping their natural singularities. Why a ready-to-eat meal plan? We will start with a subscription meal plan delivery service. This business model will guarantee your company constant revenues. Our product perfectly suits this kind of service that is having a great success as it attracts people who want to have a ready-to-eat meal without having to shop for ingredients, cook their own food, and deal with the cleaning and conservation time. These are popular among busy parents, those juggling multiple jobs, working couples, or people with a specific diet or need who prefer pre-planned meals that they can quickly prepare. Now, let's take a look into our B2B target. Since our product has multiple applications, we will expand our distribution to additional channels like gyms and vending machines in offices and universities. The supermarkets and the airlines will follow too. The Square Eat produces healthy and tasty meals for people of any age who are seeking a healthy lifestyle. We offer portion control meals that can satisfy all customers, multiple warm-up choices, and optimization of spaces during the transportation and the storage. Think that with a Square Eat, you can also be able to have a quick bite of a healthy broccoli or a salmon snack. But if you want to enjoy a full meal, you can still have the same experience. As the squares are highly digestible, practical, and handy, people who suffer from autism and food aversions have shown much interest. It fills our heart with joy knowing that people with a specific needs may have found a solution that can improve their lives. So we have experienced firsthand the inefficiencies of the traditional services. And we have seen a clear possibility of disruption in bringing a complete transformation to a sector that is growing tremendously fast, introducing a brand new solution. In order to address the most common issues, we base our production on innovative and gourmet techniques. The thermal shocking process, the low temperature cooking, and the vacuum sealing packing allows us to produce a superior quality food and sell it in an affordable price. Thanks to these features, we are also able to use almost 100% of the food we cook. This is a significant reduction in terms of waste from us and from the customer point of view. If you consider that vacuum sealing our squares, along with the thermal shocking cooking technique, naturally extends our product shelf life for up to two weeks. The individual ceiling also maximizes consumption flexibility and allows our customers to create a complete customized subscription. We are already working the Pick Your Own menu that will soon be available nationwide. Customers will be able to select the squares they like the most from a wider selection. We're going to have two kinds of competitors, one for the nationwide and the other for the local market. Meals are pre-cooked in big kitchens. Packing and cooking are made in massive quantities. That is reflected in a poor attention to details, taste, and presentation. In order to maintain a decent shelf life, the meals are often vacuum sealed together, not respecting the fact that every food has its proper longevity different from others. That becomes worse when sauces are already mixed in the package. Big issues are the condition of the food that is delivered at the final destination, often damaged, and the remarkable amount of days that the order takes to be delivered. It happens frequently that a customer is already paying for his second weekly delivery before actually being able to receive the first one. Most of our local competitors pre-cook meals in ghost kitchens, restaurants, or even at home. 
traditional cooking methods and the usual containers they use to pack their food, result in a poor product life in a space optimization. These companies have a production strictly tied to the orders and they need multiple deliveries during the week. With the purpose of meeting the daily demands of the clients, they need to organize their work in two or three intense weekly sessions. All meals must be cooked and packed together for same day delivery. Let's take a look at our production chain. Thanks to the square shape, we're able to run a mass production while using gourmet techniques. Our squares are superior quality food with well-preserved nutrients and affordable to everyone. Our operations are completely unconstrained. As soon as we receive the ingredients, we don't store them or process them like any other meat plants do. We transform them into squares right away. Extending the product's shelf life is significantly without adding any additive. Since only one ingredient is handed at a time, it can be processed in one batch and then stored as a square. Let's say we produce our chicken square in a single day and then pack the entire meal at a later stage. These allow our company to work on high volumes while keeping minimum staff on site. Therefore, improving margins. So now we're gonna take a look at the market size. The US meal plan delivery service was valued at $5 billion in 2020 and is expected to expand at a compound annual growth rate of 13% from 2021 to 2028. Europe follows at 3 billion, while Asia and Oceania at 2.5 billion. The increasing preference for healthy solution among people is expected to be the major factor contributing to this growth. The market is currently booming all over the world, but no one has cracked the code yet. So we came out with this brand new solution that could literally be the food of the future. In October 2020, Nestlé acquired meal delivery freshly for $1.5 billion. This makes the biggest deal in the history of meal plan delivery service. The launch is scheduled for the end of September, but we will be nationwide soon. Meanwhile, we are still raising money on WeFounder, which will help us grow quicker to satisfy the tremendous number of requests that we have already received. What makes us confident of our growth is that most of the money we have raised are from investors who have personally tasted the squares. We raised almost 400K between the crowdfunding platforms and private investors, well above of 100K minimum target that we had. The investments will be allocated to improve our marketing campaign, finalize the nationwide setup, research and development, and also to complete our automated production line. so much, Michael. Um, really appreciate this opportunity to, to join you here at Venture Cafe in Miami. Um, so you wanted me to share first a little bit about me. So I'm a born and raised Israeli, arrived in Miami uh, to what was supposed to be a short few years adventure. And uh, more than 18 years later, here I am. However, Miami with its wonderful people and energy became a second home. And since you and I, Michael, belong to the same Juban club, I even discovered family I would have never met otherwise. And thank God my work brings me to Israel often and allows me to work on a daily basis with incredibly innovative Israeli tech companies, including in the agri-food tech, uh, additive manufacturing, energy efficiency and advanced building technologies, advanced transportation technologies, such as smart traffic lights, a uh, company making its inwards in Miami and digital health, all making this world a better, safer and healthier one with abundance of food and water. Um, at Holland and Night, I co-chair the Israel practice uh, Holland and Knight is one of the top law firms in the U.S. The firm has 31 offices in the U.S. and abroad, and more than 1,600 lawyers and other professionals. We have a very strong corporate, IP, real estate, litigation practices, 
um, as well as one of the top federal lobbying practices in the US. My practice is focused on advising innovative Israeli companies on public policy and regulation matters and on other matters relating to their expansion in the US. A few years ago, I co-founded Women in Agri-Food Tech Group in Israel, along with amazing group of women leaders with key partners such as Startup Nation Central, Groyel, the Kitchen Food Tech Hub, and Trade Times. And here in Florida, I'm a member of the Florida chapter of the National American Agri Women, the nation's largest coalition of farm, ranch, and agribusiness women, and serve as the organization's legislative director pro bono as well as on behalf of the organization on Florida Agriculture and Consumer Services Commissioner, Nikki Fried's Ag Innovation Workgroup. So Israel is often referred to as a startup nation, and that's for a very good reason. With a population of around 8.5 million, we have the largest number of startups per capita in the world, around one startup per 1,400 people. There are more than 530 multinational corporations from 35 countries operating in Israel's tech ecosystem. 55% of those are headquartered in the US. The agri-food tech ecosystem in Israel is comprised of advanced tech solutions for both crops, livestock, and aquaculture. Using tech, including sensing, data processing, biological, machinery and robotics, materials and substances, and infrastructure components. During the recent UN Climate Conference, COP26, commitments were made to both reducing the impact of climate change on the agriculture sector and lowering the sector's contribution to global warming. The changing climate is, among others, adding to resource problems such as water scarcity and soil degradation, and the increases in temperatures rainfall variation and the frequency of intensity of extreme weather are having a toll on global agriculture and food systems. To overcome such challenges, innovative technologies and advanced farming practices have to be adopted. With Israel knowledge based on decades of experience in finding ways to grow more with less, there is a great eagerness to share this know-how with the world and most of all, with Israel's closest alley in the US and here in Miami, <laughs> no better place than, than Florida, there are more than 350 agri food tech startups in Israel, ranging from personalized nutrition, retail, and e commerce to manufacturing and logistics, farm monitoring and, and management, and, and many more. There are fascinating cellular ag technologies that produces beef steak from a cow's cell uh, to drip irrigations and, and drones. And here are a few examples, um, Michael, that you wanted me to share um, on companies we've had an opportunity to work with. So Nitafim is the world leader in drip irrigation. Uh, drip irrigation was first invented on a kibbutz in the Negev almost 60 years ago. And many farmers here in South Florida are using Netafame smart irrigation solutions. Another example is AgroScout. AgroScout is a startup, a developer of AI cloud platform to remote um, agronomy with a mission to increase its accessibility to the 500 million mostly un underserved farms worldwide. The company's platform collects data for actionable insights in crop management with an affordable solution that can be installed on, on drones you can buy in retail stores. Another cool example of a startup is Sauce, formerly known as the Say to Eat. And Sauce offers a commission-free restaurant food delivery and pickup. And, and all those companies have ties here in Miami. And it's just an example. Um, just generally about um, agri-food tech, um, and generally agriculture and food industries. In, at Holland and Night, Miami office, um, we've mostly been in, in that space. We've been advising companies, multinational, US companies and Latin companies in that space. 
there's been an everlasting interest uh, of international food, liquor, and ag companies to set foot in the US market. A few examples of um, transactions my partners have been leading uh, are, for example, uh, we've done multiple acquisitions and joint ventures for FIFS throughout the Americas. FIFS is one of the largest and oldest tropical produce imports and distributors with an infrastructure that reaches across the globe. So for example, um, a transaction involving mushroom production in Canada, um, Has Avocado joint venture in Colombia and, and many more. Another interesting example, and I know that's one of your Michael's favorite, uh, we advised um, on a more than $150 million acquisition by Burger Fi International of Anthony's coal fired pizza. Both Burger Fi and Anthony have heavy presence here in Florida. Um, uh, and Burger Fi is the owner of one of the nation's fastest growing premium fast casual restaurants chain. Another interesting example, uh, we represented Miami-based uh, Porsche Foods, a leading distributor and exporter of protein and Hispanic food products in connection with a significant investment by a New York-based uh, uh, private equity firm. And we're currently representing a Latin American dairy producer in the financing for the acquisition of a US company in the same industry. So I think this is just to give you the flavor of, of the type of transactions that are happening out of Miami and I think could be of great interest um, both for tech uh, developed here in Miami, tech coming to Miami from Israel, looking for this collaboration, looking for equity, uh, for expansion. I think there are many exciting opportunities. Thank you again, Michael. Uh, thank you for the Thai Council um, and for Jewish National Funds for, for this exciting opportunity and for Venture Cafe Miami. <laughs> Hi, everyone. How are you? My name is Nathan Hoffman. Thank you for having me, Venture Cafe of Miami. I appreciate this. Really excited to go through what we're doing here. Also, a special thank you to JNF USA Miami Group, as well as the South Florida Israel Thai Council. Thank you guys so much for letting me speak. And hopefully one day I'll meet everyone in person as things hopefully will open up soon in the near future. So we're creating what's called the Galilee Clone Institute by JNF. And something very unique about JNF for those that don't know, uh, they're visionaries when it comes to building Israel. And the goal of JNF is building the frontiers of Israel, which is the north and the south of Israel. And the Galilee Corner Institute will be located in the north of Israel, um, in the greater Kiryashmona region. And something very unique about JNF is they are the visionaries building things before they become popular. And I'll tell you a little about the region uh, shortly, but it is something that is, is very, uh, if you build it, they will come. And that's exactly what is happening here with JNF USA. So look, the pioneers of today, are very different than the pioneers of yesterday. The pioneers of yesterday were all about, you know, building the land and, you know, building homes. And, you know, you see on the left picture, basically, you know, with a, a shovel uh, and basically just getting started. The pioneers of today are really transforming the world. And it's all about innovation, entrepreneurship, and the North of Israel, which I'll tell you about, is, is really gearing up to be something very special and being with a focus on culinary tech, food tech, and agri-tech. So briefly, for those who don't know, like I said about JNF, they're very, very well connected in the north and south of Israel. And you can't start something like a culinary institute in the north of Israel without some significant help. Obviously, this doesn't work without JNF. It doesn't work without a region that's ready to grow. And thankfully, both of those aspects are prepared and we are moving forward with an amazing plan. And I'll tell you about the area, which is very unique, is because the north of Israel um, obviously houses uh, many of the products that are you know, grown in Israel. 60% of the produce is in the north. 
has the best environment for growing. And so after a lot of research, you know, the, the Israeli government and, and different companies really looked at the region to figure out, you know, the assets of, of what was actually in the north and realized uh, the tr tremendous impact that the north has when it comes to culinary. And so they've placed incubators, ag tech, food tech, um, incubators in the north of Israel. And there's a huge, huge group coming in. You have uh, venture capital from JBP Partners. You have our crowd that's invested, Tanuba, Tempo, Finster, some big, big names that are coming to the region because of what is happening in food tech and ag tech. And it's super exciting uh, that we are placing a culinary institute right in the action. And so look, the reason for creating a culinary institute is utilizing the assets of the region. It's obviously wanting to build jobs, bring uh, different people uh, with different strengths when it comes to culinary to the north. Like I said, the different partnerships, um, the government um, providing major tax incentives and benefits for companies in the north. And it's, it's really coming together um, with, with so much energy right now, uh, even with COVID, um, because it is, is really ripe for all that's happening in, in this sector. In, in, in for example, um, alternative proteins, where Israel is at the top of the list when it comes to businesses and companies working in alternative proteins and alternative uh, cultured meats and, and all things uh, you know, that's related to food tech and the environment. And so things are really shaping up to be quite amazing right now in the north of Israel. And I'll just tell you quickly, our strategic objectives when it comes to the GCI and the Culinary Institute is first of all, reinventing culinary education. Education obviously has to change. And so this is something we are focused on. In culinary, it's really about experience. It's really about getting out there and learning from experts. And that's what we will be doing in the field, uh, hands-on with the entrepreneurs. So reinventing culinary education is a big one. Building br bridges through food. It's one of the most diverse regions in Israel. So bringing different ethnicities together uh, around the table is always a win-win. Um, obviously, we want this to be a profitable, self-supporting um, destination business for tourists because it's not only going to be a culinary institute, there's going to be you know, classes for tourists and um, you know, um, different programs for individuals that want to get into you know, whether it's beer brewing or wine and, and cheese tasting. Uh, so many different areas when it comes to tourism. Um, and, and obviously supporting the economic development and tourism in the region is huge and being responsible, food responsible is what we call it, basically taking care of the environment, doing what we have to do when it comes to not, utilize, not using plastics, you know, using dishes uh, and doing our best with uh, composting and, and really taking care of everything that comes in and out of our institute. So I'll just tell you a few top things about what we're doing and I don't have much time. Like I said, it's really the right place at the right time with all that's happening. Uh, we're also uh, in partnership with the college in the region, which is Tel Chai, um, working with them. They also have a um, food sciences program. They're working on a, a, it's called a food institute, where they're basically, they purchase very, very expensive equipment and allowing startups to utilize their equipment, you know, at very small prices, you know, a fraction of the price. Uh, so allowing these students and entrepreneurs to be able to create prototypes with you know a lot less money that's usually needed and so there's just really so much happening like i told you with the, the venture capital coming in uh in many different uh sectors uh really things are coming together uh beautifully and you know like i said one thing about what we're really focused on is, is really changing culinary education and so we get into many things like food media uh storytelling you know entrepreneurship uh, food activism, basically getting our students involved in the region, doing many different things that are not done at your typical culinary institute with a big focus on technology, which is why we will be, you know, learning from some of the top incubators. Um, JVP Partners has an incubator that um, JNF is partnered with. And so we will be working with them. We'll be working with our crowd, um, the ag tech incubators in the region. All of this allowing our students to really get inside access to what's happening in the region. And you know, the, the goal is really to utilize this technology, allow the students to be able to utilize technology before it actually is out in the environment. So getting the students familiar with things that are going to come out in the environment, letting them work on things that have, you know, um, like for example, uh, working with alternative proteins and making them taste good. Because at the end of the day, I went to a 
pretty cool uh, food tech event. And uh, one of the CEOs of, uh, of a group called the um, Good Food Institute, which really focuses on turning proteins. It's at the end of the day, if it doesn't taste good, no one's going to eat it. It doesn't matter if it's going to save the world. Uh, it has to taste good. So this is where, obviously, our culinary students come in and are able to work in areas um, like alternative proteins and helping them you know, figure out ways to make things taste good that usually aren't the best tasting. And like I said earlier, it's all about experience, learning about the vineyard from a vineyard and not from a book, hands-on experiential learning. Again, experience turns into to memorableness, um, allowing you to really have great experiences. So that's for the tourism side and also obviously for the students, um, getting a great experience, and allowing them to really um, see, touch, smell, all things culinary, everything from farming all the way to manufacturing, producing, and giving them experiences all throughout the, the food chain. And at the end of the day, our big focus is on the students, so making sure the students get what they need um, and, and really having a concierge approach to taking care of the students in the long run. And obviously, when it comes to the, the region, as things become more popular, as these businesses come out of these incubators, Obviously, more money flows in, business opportunities, allowing you to produce the region, which is what is already in play. Um, it's something very unique. Like, for example, <clears throat> we are um, positioned in a kibbutz. And so even before we've built anything, we're in the process of building. But even before we built anything, houses are being sold based on the fact that we're coming to the region. So it just shows you the importance of these businesses coming in and different companies um, and, and to build a family, obviously, um, you don't want to move to an area that is under, underdeveloped and doesn't have opportunities. And so creating those opportunities obviously will bring people. And with people come families. So obviously it's much cheaper in the north of Israel than a Tel Aviv or a Jerusalem. Uh, so bringing people to the north will allow you know, smaller families to grow and to actually be able to afford a home, which is not very possible in the, in, in the middle of Israel. We're going to have programs for children. You know, obviously they're the future. So putting together programs for the community is very important. We're going to be, you know, it's, it's a huge uh, focus area of us to make sure that we spend time with our community and do programs for the community, for locals, not only for an international audience. And at the end of the day, you know, all of our students that leave will be valuable uh, because of all the experience they'll have, all the different innovations and tech that they'll be able to be utilizing. Uh, again, it's just something very unique to be in such a small area and to be able to go to so many different places, see so many things, um, really at a quick, quick ride. So I'll give you a few updates real quick. Is you know we're on target for a fall 2022 opening. You know we've launched our website GalileeConnorInstitute.com or GCIByJF.com. We've launched our website. We just launched applications, pre-applications for our first program, um, which is very exciting. Social media is up. We created a brand identity. We have some great partners, um, some great PR so far. Uh, here's a few renderings. This is old uh, and will be updated in the near future, but just a few renderings to get uh, you know, an, an example of what we're building. The building on the left is focused on tourism, where you have your food um, areas like um, beer brewing, wine and food and spirit tasting, uh, chocolatier, bakery, cafe, uh, where you get to you know, have a lot of fun, enjoy some food with some great views. And the building on the right is where we'll have a, a restaurant where those windows are at the top, um, giving you a full view of the Hula Valley. And then below, you have classes all throughout for the Cloner Institute, a demonstration kitchen, um, and a lot of space for events. Here's another view. Here's the view of the restaurant. Again, these renderings will be updated, but uh, this is what they look like so far. Uh, this is a demonstration kitchen. Here's an example of one of our, our main kitchens. And rooms for the students will also have on-site uh, dorm rooms and there's a couple of views of that so that's it i just you know thank you guys so hello much hello to the venture to family yama community it's a great pleasure to be here and we've heard a lot of speakers talk about food tech and about science and one has to talk about when talking about food one has to talk about the farmers and about agriculture and uh, what says more a agrotech than growing food in the desert? So I want to introduce you the uh, interesting things that are being done in Central Arva, right in the middle of the Arva Desert in Israel. 
Um, I'm going to share my screen for a second to show you where they are vice at. So actually, Central Ava is located halfway between Beersheba and Elat, right along the Jordanian border, in the middle of the Ava Desert. It's six percent of the land of Israel, nothing but sand all around it. This is part of the ancient land the Israelites have walked on their way to Israel. It's actually mentioned in the Bible of one of their stops and one of the challenging parts of being in the desert. Uh, this region of Santa Lava uh, is a region of multiple challenges. Uh, this is uh, one of the driest areas in Israel, then less than one inch of rain annually, and the temperature is extreme. Right now it's about 120 and it's the end of the summer, so you can understand uh, how extreme the climate is. And regardless of the fact that the, this, the land here is not fruitful and we've got a lot of issues with water, uh, despite the fact that we, are a, we don't have a lot of rain for a, a year, we're not connected to the national water grid of Israel. So all the water that we use comes from an underground wells and the water that we use are brackish and deteriorates both in quality and quantity. Despite of all that, uh, this region with its 600 family farms produces more than 50% of Israel's fresh vegetable export. It means that more than half of the vegetables and fruits that Israel is exporting abroad comes from a desert region with no water. And the fact we've been able to do that, and not just do that, but share that knowledge with thousands of students is because uh, agriculture in the Alava is not simple agriculture. This is agrotech, high-tech agriculture. Actually, our late president, Shimon Peres, uh, said that high-tech in Israel began with agriculture, but it didn't end with agriculture because if you want to grow anything in the desert, you have to invest a lot in knowledge, in know-how, and in techniques to help you overcome the natural challenges of the desert. We grow in the Arava lots of fruits and vegetables from the beautiful melons that you see to dates and peppers and tomatoes and zucchinis and flowers and everything that our scientists can uh, adjust to the harsh climate and bad conditions of the desert, and we are making the desert bloom. Uh, the scientists uh, that help us, help the farming community here cope with the desert and uh, succeed uh, is actually part of the Arava community. The Arava Research and Development Center has been sponsored by JNF uh, ever since it was established in the 80s, and it generates knowledge, practical knowledge for the farmers. This is not a research and development center that is focused on academic questions, but are focusing on daily day challenges that the farmers are having and they're responding to the changing conditions uh, that uh, our region is going through as part of climate changes, uh, as part of multiple changes that are happening um, with lots of factors and they don't need just to see what the present challenges are, but they also need to look into the future and see what will be the next products, what will be the next crops that we need to adjust to the desert land. Uh, you have to understand nothing that we grow can grow naturally. It has to be helped with a lot of science in order to make anything here grow. Actually, if you think about it, um, what we do here in the desert for many, many years is coping with two very important national and international challenges. The first one is desertification. That's the process of desert taking over what once was land. Our countries that are now encountering droughts or other difficulties. And this is a, a phenomenon that is occurring around the world in massive numbers. We are losing hundreds and thousands of hundreds of acres a year to the desert. And the second challenge or the second issue is food safety and security. As the world population is growing at an exponential rate, the natural resources of the planet are not just not growing, they are diluting. And we need to find out how we can make more with the less that we have. Now here in the desert, we've been growing food um, with no conditions at all. That was the baseline of the region ever since it was founded. And yet we've been able to do that thanks to a lot of knowledge which leads to sustainable agriculture. 
We believe that the knowledge that is being generated in the Alva not only helps the farmers of the Alva, but to a lot of other countries that are facing a similar challenges and other challenges that relates to those two very important challenges of food safety and security and desertification. The knowledge that is being generated here in the Alva is being shared around the world through a special school and um, one of Jane's partners in Israel, uh, which is called ACAT, Alva International Center for Agriculture Training. This is a school that teaches more than 1,000 students annually from 13 different countries, mainly from Africa and Asia. We're focusing on development countries and we are teaching students, young people in their 20s, skills and know-hows in a very unique hands-on agricultural program that involves practical training in the fields of the Arava with the farmers and also theoretical knowledge uh, from the experts of the Arava, the R&D experts and local experts that can give them the best experience theoretically and practically how they can take a region that is suffering from drought and is suffering from a famine and turn it into a region that can feed and support its own people. We look at our students as agents of change that can create a ripple effect of change in their own countries. Our mission is actually to turn farmers into entrepreneurs. We believe that farmers today are business people in the fields of farming, but they need to adjust, uh, need to change from the traditional way of thinking the countries that we're working for with are very traditional in the way they conduct agriculture to a more entrepreneurship, uh, out of the box thinking, creativity, and also social responsibility, understanding that with the knowledge that they gain here in Israel, in the Arva, and not just the knowledge, the spirit of pioneering, they can really change the lives of their community. The ACAT program not only uh, provides the region with uh, jobs through the campus and the school that employs hundreds of people, it also provides an important aspect of Tikkun Olam, one of the most important Jewish values of making uh, the world a better place. Uh, we are helping people by empowering them, not by just uh, giving them a fish, but teaching them how can they invent a better hook that will, cert that will suit their conditions. We are also um, producing the best ambassadors to the state of Israel through showing uh, our students what it really means to be a pioneer here in Israel and what it me really means to uh, in to uh, in be involved in a a community that is doing innovating things and always thinking ahead how we can change things better in the food and the agriculture world. Another aspect that we are also looking into here in the Arava is environmental studies. When you talk about food you have and, uh, and agriculture, you have to be cautious of the environmental aspect. And in the Arava Institute for Environmental Studies, we try to combine with the best uh, sustainable agriculture techniques uh, together with the, uh, minimizing the effect on the environment and how we can learn from the environment to be better farmers and better scientists. I want to end by thanking you for your time.